We're going to be in Romans chapter 7 this morning. And Lord willing, next week as well. It's another one of these passages where the further in I got, the more I realized it wasn't a one sermon topic. So we're going to divide them up. In particular this morning, we're going to be looking at Paul's comparison of the church to the bride of Christ. How we are connected intimately to the Savior and what that relationship, uh, what kind of results should we see from our being united to Him. So we're going to start by reading the first three verses, Romans chapter 7, beginning in verse 1. Do you not know, brothers and sisters, for I'm speaking to those who know the law, that the law has authority over someone only as long as that person lives. For example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she's released from the law that binds her to him. So then, if she has sexual relations with another man while her husband is still alive, she's called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is released from that law and is not an adulteress, even if she marries another man. I want us to think back to chapters 5 and 6 and some of the things we noticed about the problems and the, the joys of being born in the image of Adam, being human beings. One of the things that many of us enjoy most about being human beings is our marriages. The fact that uh, we're able to form bonds that last for a lifetime and uh, you know that person better perhaps if you know anyone else on the planet and they know you and uh, you take care of them and they take care of you. It's a completely different kind of relationship than what we have with other people. But being born human is sort of like an arranged marriage. I think most of us got to choose our husbands and wives for ourselves. Hopefully our parents were on board and thought that it was a good idea The people that we chose for ourselves. But it's only been in the last couple of hundred years that uh, arranged marriages weren't the rule instead of the exception, even in the Western culture. People would set their children up with fringe children or even relatives' children at different times because they wanted to make sure to have control over who was married to whom. Well, when we were born human, we didn't get to choose. We were married to the offspring of Adam. We became part of that Adamic family. But when we're born again and become the bride of Christ, that's a choice we get to make. We get to fall in love with him as he fell in love with us. We get to give ourselves to him as he gave himself for us. But it's still a binding contract. It's a binding decision. Paul writes about the law and how a woman was bound to her husband as long as he was alive, but if he died, she was free then to marry another. He's, he's talking about that part in chapter 6 where he says that we have died to sin. We gave up. We died to being a part of the Adam part of the equation so that we could become a part of Christ and become his bride. Uh, I don't know if all of us had similar wedding vows I've done a few weddings through the years that did not have what we call traditional vows, but part of the traditional vows has the phrase, and do you promise to keep yourself only for him or for her as long as you both shall live? And the answer is, yes. I do, or yes. So that is a promise that we make to our spouse before God and man, that we will be uh, only for them, that we We'll keep ourselves uh, heart, body, and soul for our bride alone uh, or for our uh, spouse alone. Now, when we make that vow and become spouses to Christ, it has just as much and perhaps even more of a binding nature. So when we see ourselves as the bride of Christ, we see ourselves as being in a relationship that lasts 
as long as we both shall live. Now, your understanding, my understanding of eternal life is that doesn't ever stop, right? Will Jesus ever die again? No, no right? He's alive, never to die again, which means that the husband of the church will always be alive. So Paul's point is, if you're married to someone who never dies, are you ever free from your commitment to that somebody? No. no. So the bride of Christ is always committed to Christ, and Christ has made us everlasting through his blood, and therefore Christ is always connected to his church. I want to just read you about three different passages, one from the Old Testament, two from the New Testament that have to do with this relationship of deity being married to humanity, God being married to the people of Israel, Jesus being married to the church. The first one is from Isaiah chapter 54. It's a beautiful passage. It says, Sing, barren woman, you who never bore a child, burst into song and shout for joy, you who never were in labor, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch your tent curtains wide. Don't hold back. Lengthen the cords. Strengthen your stakes. For you will spread out to the right and to the left. Your descendants will dispossess nations and settle in their desolate cities. Don't be afraid. You will never be put to shame. Do not fear disgrace. You will never be humiliated. You will forget the shame that you had in your youth and remember no more the reproach of your widowhood for your maker is your husband. The Lord Almighty is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. He is called the God of all of the earth. The Lord will call you back as if you were a wife deserted and distressed in spirit, a wife who married young only to be rejected. That's what God says. For a brief moment I abandon you, but with deep compassion I will bring you back. In a surge of anger, I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting kindness I will have compassion on you. That's what the Lord, your Redeemer, says. Isn't that beautiful? Don't worry. It's okay. I love you, and I have brought you back to myself. So God, in the place of a husband, looks at Israel and says, I know that you went away from me. I know that you adulterated yourself against me. I know that you didn't bear good fruit in our relationship, but I've brought you back because I love you, because I want what's best for you. Ephesians chapter 5 talks about Jesus in the relationship with the church. We'll get the preamble because it talks a lot about you and I. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does for the church. For we are members of his body. And for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. And the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. So Paul draws this beautiful picture of all of the things we expect out of our own relationships. How would you treat your own wife? where you're going to give to her, you're going to care for her, you're going to sacrifice self for her good. And then he says, I want you to know that's what Jesus does for his bride. That's how Jesus treats his church. Ultimate sacrifice so that she could receive all the good things that are his to give. Uh, Martin Luther wrote a beautiful piece back in about 1525 uh, about the relationship of Jesus and the church. And this was his take on the thing. It says, when you get married, all of the things that used to belong to the bride now belong to the groom, and all of the things that used to just belong to the groom now also belong to the bride. So the bride comes to the wedding, 
and she has guilt and shame. And the husband comes to the wedding and he has grace and mercy. And the church receives all of the grace and mercy that Jesus brings to the relationship. And Jesus takes on himself all of the guilt and the shame that the church brings with her. And so Jesus gives all that he needs to give so that his bride can be presented before God in a beautiful way. 2 Corinthians 11 talks more about it. I hope you'll put up with me for a little bit of foolishness, says Paul. Yes, put up with me. I'm jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as pure virgins to him. But I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. If someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus that we preach, or if you receive a different spirit from the spirit that you've already received, or a different gospel from the one that you've already accepted, you put up with it easily enough. So Paul is saying to the Corinthian church, you're listening to all kinds of people who are trying to pull you away from that one true relationship that you already have with Jesus. One of the greatest things, I think, about being married is that you have that, that ready answer for anyone who might be uh, in love with you or who might come to you and say, I want you to be in love with me. What's the answer? I'm taken. I don't have, I'm not at my leisure to come to you. I'm not at my leisure to even entertain the idea of being with you because I'm already with someone else. And so Paul tells the Corinthians, I brought you to Jesus and to Jesus alone. And now you're with Jesus alone. So you can't even consider the possibility of listening to these false teachers. They're trying to lead you away from the one to whom I promised you, the one that I gave you in marriage. So it's not a new thing. It's a forever thing that God has always loved his people as if they were his bride. And God is a jealous God. And he doesn't like to share. So as long as our husband is alive, and he will be alive forever, and as long as we are alive, and we will be alive forever, then we are promised to one husband and one husband alone. Look down at uh, verse 4, chapter 7, verse 4. So my brothers and my sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit for God. For when we were in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions aroused us by the law were at work in us so that we bore fruit for death. But now by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Another thing about being human and about being married that is something we enjoy is our children. And when we get to a certain age, maybe <coughs> our children's children, maybe even our children's children's children come into our lives. And we celebrate that because it is the fruit of the union that we have with this one special person. And so we're married together and we enjoy our lives together, but we also leave fruit for generations to come because of our union. Paul is talking to people who seem to be Jewish, right? And he says, I'm talking to those of you who understand the law. And you died to the law so that you could be united with Jesus. The law is dead. And since your husband is dead, then you could be joined to another. And so they join themselves to Christ. But we can insert ourselves uh, as those who have died to self or who have died uh, to be purely human and married ourselves to our Savior. But the ultimate statement of unity in marriage is offspring. Well, how do we count our offspring in our marriage to Christ? Some people would say, well, it's new Christians. If we have offsprings as in spiritual children, then that counts as our offspring of Christ. I think maybe we're talking about what Paul would call the fruits of the Spirit things that happen in our lives that are 
outside of us that have fruit outside of our immediate life, but that go on, right? So husband and wife come together and they have a child, and that child has kind of a life of its own. When we are doing things because of our relationship with Jesus, that spreads outside of us, and it kind of has a life of its own. And you can even say that we have children and children's children and maybe even children's children's children in our life because of the spiritual things that we've done in our relationship with Jesus. We've given blessings to people. We've taught people. We've encouraged people. We've loved people. We've shown God's blessings to people. And then those people take the blessings and the love and the grace that we've given them and they pass it on to someone who passes it on to someone. And all of these people who are coming into a relationship with Jesus have these blessings that originated from our union with Christ but then spread out from us. Look over at Galatians chapter 5. Let's remind ourselves of some of the things that Paul lists in his fruits of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5. We're going to start reading in verse 19. The NIV says the acts of the flesh. I prefer the fruits. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. And I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. And the immediate question is, why? Because that's the kind of fruit that you bear when you're children of Adam. That's the old relationship. That's the one that we should have died to, or if it's in the case of the law of Moses, that which died and set us free, to be married to a new husband. And our new husband does not bring those kinds of things. That's not the offspring that we have. We have offspring with Christ that are, look at verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. And since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, or envying each other. So who we used to be and the relationship that we used to have with the flesh had offspring. But we're not very proud of those offspring. We look back at those things that we did and we say, man, I wish I'd never done that. I wish I'd never lived that way. I wish I had not produced that kind of offspring. But they're still alive. Do you know people that knew you when? And somebody that's surprised that you are who you are now. Even if you grew up in the church, there are people that know you before you were mature in your Christianity. When you still had a pretty good dose of Adam going on alongside your relationship with Jesus. Right? And so you were doing some good things in Christ, but you were doing some evil things because of your relationship with the flesh. They remember those things. They, they kind of have a life of their own. Children from a former marriage. Maybe some good things that we did because we were moral people and we tried to do nice things, but some evil things as well because we didn't know Christ as well as we know Christ now. We weren't as mature in Christ as we are now. But now we're bearing fruit with a new spouse. We're having children that will outlast us, that people will look back on and remember us for having this offspring. Right? So Christ plus his bride the Christ, or plus his bride the church, equals an offspring that is worthy of the world to see. Our offspring made through the Spirit look like their daddy. <laughs> and the world needs to see their daddy. The world needs to see Jesus living in us. 
He needs to see the offspring that comes through the Spirit at work in our lives so that they can see that He's alive and well and loving and graceful and compassionate and longing to have them come and be His bride as you and I. Would you pray with me, please? <coughs> Father, help us to make you proud. Jesus, help us to be faithful, to live in you and for you and through you. Father, we pray that you would help us to be strong enough to live the kind of lives that we need to live so that the world will see you and Jesus and your spirit living and active in our lives. May we leave behind good things that others might celebrate your goodness and your grace. To Jesus that we pray. If you need to respond to the invitation this morning, we would sure love to help you the way we can as we stand and sing. What can one?